All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. If we could, we could uh, maybe go ahead and start moving towards the seat. So if we're going to sit down or, or. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. Today is April 2nd, 2024, and the time is 932. Uh, I would like to call on the Pastor Jay Reisner from First Assembly of God for the invocation. Please stand. Lord, we thank you for this day, and we will be glad in it, Lord. Lord, as we gather today for the county commissioners meeting, Lord, the first thing I come to you about is you have a lot of people here today. And each of us come in with different needs in our life and different things we're facing. And the commissioners too. And Lord, I just ask that you will be with each individual. Lord, there are those here that need a physical touch, a spiritual touch. There are those that emotionally and even financially financially need something. And Lord, I just pray that, that you will be with every single person here. And in the busyness of today, may we just take a deep breath and as we breathe in, know that you're here with us. And God, I pray for the commissioners. I pray for decisions that will be made today that will affect many people. I pray that you will give them ears to hear and eyes to see. But God, the thing you even told us to do is to ask for wisdom. And I pray that you give each of these commissioners, each of those making decisions, you give them wisdom in what they hear, what they see, but also in what they speak. And I just pray that you'll be with them all. And uh, Lord, everything we face, you said that you would either speak peace in our life or you would walk through the storm with us. And I pray that you'll be with us today, every single one, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please remain standing and join me with, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we'll start off today with our ceremonial ceremonials. We have three ceremonial presentation this morning. I would like to recognize Commissioner Pendergrass for the first presentation. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman. If I could have Lori and Pablo and, and um, Karen come up front and give us um, an update real quick on animal services. We have Lori here this morning. She's a five-year-old Boston American Bull Pit mix i believe yes we call her a boston bully and she is adorable and she is playful and looking for a home so hopefully somebody watching today will adopt her and you know we got some great programs coming up in april if you want to give us a brief yep. real quick we do it is our uh, 10th annual flip this kennel this month on april 13th so if you want to decorate a kennel please get in touch with us you can do that it is a great program we have every year and to celebrate this year, our theme is decades. So all adoptions are just $10 with an approved application. So you can uh, adopt Lori today if you would like to. Don't wait until the 13th. And um, come on out on the 13th and see all the decorated kennels and catteries as well. And we, you know, like we mentioned this morning, we also have rabbit cages if you want to decorate a rabbit cage as well. I'm sure we'll be getting some rabbits and stuff after uh, Easter. That'll yes. be coming up next month. We have a couple now, so I'm sure we're going to have more. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you, and thank you for all thank your staff you. for everything you do out there for the animals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Lori, hope you good find luck, a good home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, but, Commissioner Pendergrass. Uh, if, if I could, I'm sorry. It's a little bit off the agenda here. Uh, you know, one of the things I want to express this morning, every, and thank you, staff, because one of our greatest resources in Lee County is our staff, our employees. Without employees, our county buildings would be empty. There's no government without the employees. And when you have tenure employees, it's really important and how important it is to the county providing services and knowledge. I'd like to recognize Randy Searchy this morning. Randy Searchy has been with Lee County for 35 years and he's retiring this month. And Randy, thank you for your years of service. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you.
thank you all. You know, it's just, Randy didn't want to be, make a big deal about it. He'll probably close my road off my house now or something. But um, Randy, everything you, everywhere you drive in Lee County, every road in Lee County you see, Randy and his crew has touched those roads over the years and say, thank you again, Randy, for all your knowledge and your support and everything you've done for Lee County. Thank you so much. We've really paid a lot of roads. So again, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Chairman. Okay, uh, at this time, Commissioner Hammond, uh, would you like to present the next ceremony? Chairman, thank you very much. It's a real privilege to be able to read this one for the folks at Family Initiative. Would, would uh, David Brown and the whole team, anybody you brought with you, come forward to the podium? And if you'll just stand at the podium, I'll read the resolution into the record, and then we'll take a picture, and then uh, if somebody will say a few words afterwards, Sounds good. that'd be great. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all again. <clears throat> okay, the resolution reads as follows. Whereas April is International Autism Acceptance Month, a time when our nation reflects on the unique skills individuals with autism spectrum disorder share with our community. And whereas Family Initiative is instrumental in serving children, adolescents, and young adults on the autism spectrum through support programs, clinical services, education, and advocacy, this work is done in collaboration with the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, the Department of Children and Families, and the Agency of Healthcare Administration. And whereas Family Initiative proudly offers these services throughout Southwest Florida with the support of the Collaboratory and the United Way of Lee, Hendry, Glades, and Okeechobee Counties. And whereas Family Initiative reports serving over 2,600 unique families throughout Southwest Florida each year and continues to grow to meet the needs of the autism community. And whereas it is critical that we provide individuals on the autism spectrum access to the resources and opportunities they need to reach their full potential and assist them in being successful in all environments. And whereas each year in April, Family Initiative hosts numerous countywide events to recognize and support individuals on the autism spectrum throughout our county, along with the, the invaluable business, philanthropic, and community stakeholders who support our mission. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Lee County, Florida does hereby proclaim April 2024 Autism Acceptance Month in Lee County this is duly executed this second day of April by our chairman, Mike Greenwell. Congratulations on Autism Acceptance Month, and thank you for the work that you all do. Yeah. So Chairman, uh, County Commissioners, thank you so much. Uh, today being the second day of April, uh, today is actually World Autism Day. Um, so celebrated around the, the world today in recognition of uh, the phenomenal families and individuals we get to work with every day. Um, I know when we came here uh, and we launched Family Initiative um, almost nine years ago now, uh, the Center for Disease Control report one in 101 kids in the US is diagnosed on the autism spectrum. Today, that statistic is one in 36 kids um, in the United States are diagnosed on the autism spectrum. So as the prevalence rate has continued to explode across our nation, um, as our community has grown exponentially, um, you can imagine the work that our team does and what our families do to support um, all the individuals on the autism spectrum uh, is incredibly important. As we alluded to, uh, Lee County served over 2,600 unique kids last year, um, which speaks volumes again about the need. Um, and our enormous gratitude um, to the county. We'd be remiss. Um, Dave Horner, Chris Brady, everybody in the entire team of Lee County government has been unbelievable. And uh, we're proud. I feel like our county is a model for us, the state of Florida, about what we can do to actually have inclusion in a community. Um, and so we're grateful for y'all's leadership and to the team. Um, they've been nothing but spectacular. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank Congratulations. You. Oh, uh, the last ceremonial will be presented by Commissioner Hammond as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, I'd like to ask anybody who's here for Gopher Tortoise Day to please come to the podium. I believe it's the folks from the Calusa Nature Center. Yeah, come on forward. This is pretty exciting. I think all of us have a story about a gopher tortoise, you know, that we've seen, you know, around town or, or growing up. So what a cool day to recognize uh, these wonderful creatures. So whereas the gopher tortoise has been living on Earth for 500,000 to 2 million years, and whereas the gopher tortoise is currently listed as a threatened species in the state of Florida and in parts of the United States, they are federally listed as threatened. Whereas the gopher tortoise is considered a keystone species due to the protection uh, of their burrows, their burrows provide rather, to more than 350 other species, some of which are also listed as threatened. Whereas a thriving population of gopher tortoises in our region helps to sustain the area's ecology and provide our citizens with a source of joy and appreciation for nature. And whereas recent efforts by the state of Florida are underway to help ensure that gopher tortoises are restored with secure, viable populations throughout their range in Florida. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Lee County, Florida, hereby proclaims April 10th, 2024, as Gopher Tortoise Day in Lee County and encourages all citizens to raise their awareness of the guidelines and conservation measures in place to help protect this species. It's signed the second day of April by our Chairman, Mike Greenwell. Congratulations on Gopher Tortoise Day, y'all. <laughs> For a picture, I'd like to present that to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again. Thank you. All right, we got one more by Sam for the record here. If you'll just hang out with us. Yep, here we go. Great. And will somebody say a few words for us? <coughs> so, hello, good, uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Cindy Banya. I'm the executive director for the Clusa Nature Center and Planetarium. And this has actually been a joint effort with my friend here. Introduce yourself in our organization. Uh, I'm James Candy. I represent the East Lee Wildlife Stewardship Group. We're a newly formed uh, nonprofit to help guide with pro preserving our wildlife in East Lee and Lee County. So we thought it was important because we have new residents on the Clusa Nature Center and Planetarium property, uh, including Ghoul for Tortoise that have moved into our area. We know that they're an amazing part of our wildlife here in Southwest Florida. And we appreciate the Lee County Board of County Commissions for helping us to make this proclamation and invite everybody to further celebrate with us on Go for Tortoise Day, April 10th, at the Clusa uh, Nature Center and Planetarium. From 6.30 p.m., we will be having a reception and event for all Go for Tortoise enthusiasts and a very special showing of a movie. Uh, April 10th will be the public release of a movie called The Go for Tortoise Games, uh, referred to as Saving the Heart of Florida, and it really dis uh, goes into discussing how we're going to protect and preserve this uh, valuable species. Thanks. Great. So we look forward to seeing everybody there in the evening of April 10th. This will be open to the public and we will accept donations, of course, to continue our conservation work around Southwest Florida and particularly Lee County. Thank you so much. Thanks for all you Thank guys you. do. Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. Oh. Chairman, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, that concludes the presentations for this morning. Uh, at this time, we will take up uh, the recap. There are no items to defer. There are two items recommended for revisions, item C6 and item C21. Do we have a motion for revisions? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay, we have a motion uh, from Commissioner Hammond and a second from Commissioner Rain. Uh, at this time, uh, we will take up uh, public comment on the revision C6 and C21. Do we have any public comment on those? Marcellus? Good morning, um, Marsh Ellis for the record. I'm just speaking about um, item six, which is the conflict of interest um, regarding representation for wild blue. Um, I'm just um, 
concerned that uh, there's you know consolidation for sure happening among um, environmental consultants. We have a limited number, uh, a, a shrinking number of uh, professionals that are involved in development issues in Lee County. And when we have a smaller pool, then we tend to see more conflicts of interest. So I, I'm concerned about um, um, that as well as public perception uh, so that we can really make every effort to avoid conflicts of interest and um, address them. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak on item C6 or item 21, C21? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Um, uh, the board have any discussion? None? Okay. Uh, so we have a motion to uh, approve from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Wayne. Any objections? No, no objections. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Okay, at this time we'll go to the consent agenda. Uh, moving to the consent agenda, Commissioner Hammond, uh, do you have any items to pull? I have none, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Pendergrass? None. Commissioner Sandelli? None. Commissioner Wayne? None. I have none. Uh, we, we will move on to public comment on the consent agenda. Do we have any public comment on the consent agenda at this time? Let me check for cards. I do have a card here from Deborah Swisher Hicks. Hi, thank you. I'm Deborah Swisher Hicks. I'm a resident of Pine Island. Um, I just have some questions regarding the contract that's going to be signed for the water for Blue Titan, um, I show, when I looked at the contract, it's a very open-ended contract. In the sense, you guys are basing your information on what was the previous year, but not necessarily the whole contract of how much it's increased every year. So I was wondering if you guys were aware of what the typical increase is per year that the county uh, residents are gonna have to end up paying for. The contract is also very open-ended. It's uh, not limited to particular areas that the county doesn't have public water to. Uh, I do see the only one that was listed in there was the landfill. And of course, getting good drinkable water out there is important for our you know, employees and residents. There's also, um, I also have an issue with the name of the company, but that's something for me to bring up at a later day. And the, the amount of this contract is gonna be around $875,000, and that's only if it stays at the status quo, the amount that you guys are currently expecting to pay. And there's other things that the government at this point, because we're still re rebuilding from FEMA, uh, not FEMA, that's a different issue, um, rebuilding from IRMA. Ian, sorry, I, I, that's a word I try never to use. Uh, there's a lot of roads that still need to be rebuilt, the community centers, the parks, uh, new parks because you guys are expanding. Um, so much, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What number was that, Mr. Chairman? Do you know what number no. she was talking about? No, I do not. <laughs> um, all right, also on the consent agenda, Marsha Ellis? Uh, I'm good. Okay. I, I out of okay. okay. At this time, would anyone else like to speak on the consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, I will close uh, public comment. Um, so, sorry, next page. Uh, is there a motion to approve the balance of the items? Move the balance. I'll okay. We have a commissioner, uh, commissioner Ham, uh, commissioner Pendergrass, motion to approve. Uh, we have a, a, a second from Commissioner Sandelli. Are there any objections? Consent agenda. Seeing none, uh, it passes, consent agenda passed unanimously. Um, at this time, we will move on to the administrative agenda. Uh, Mr. County Manager, please introduce item number one on the administrative agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, this item still authorized submission of infrastructure and public facility applications for CDBGDR funding, and I'd like to ask Mr. Salyer to present the item. Good morning, Commissioners. We are seeking the Board's authorization to develop applications on behalf of Lee County government and potential partner agencies that fall within unincorporated Lee County. 
So if you authorize uh, staff to work with these applicants as well as our own internal departments, uh, applications would be developed for submission to the CDBGDR program no later than May 24th. Uh, this, these are the infrastructure applications that ultimately will go to your evaluation committee in July. We anticipate bringing back award recommendations in the month of August. So we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, commissioners, at this time, do we have any questions for staff or any comments? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I will call a public comment. We have anyone who would like to speak on the item? Marsha Ellis? Yes. Good morning, Marsha Ellis for the record. Um, so after reviewing these projects, I see a couple that, uh, that didn't make it through and that's really uh, my concern because I don't know the, the fate of, of those two, I of two of the items that uh, concern me. Um, it, the first is uh, the um, Salus Care the or that needed the behavioral health hub. Uh, we know that kids that were experiencing crises um, were having to be diverted um, post um, Ian, that this is a, a big issue. We know the topic is very concerned about behavioral health, mental health services in this community, and um, it's, it's a priority to serve our kids. So I'm not sure. I see that, uh, that it was eligible, but um, it was not approved. So I, I'd just like to get an update to know if that's going to be looked at in the future. Secondly would be the uh, wild blue um, lake, the waves that were generated during Ian, and all of the damage that was inflicted upon that community. Um, that is a community that uh, um, I personally was named in uh, when it was developed in 2015 uh, as, uh, and noticed. So I'm really concerned about the impacts to the greater watershed, um, not just the Estero Basin, but we also have interaction with uh, the Flint Pen and the Imperial Basin right there. It's managing a great deal of surface water, um, impacts to the, the uh, natural systems, the littoral edge through that erosion. So Though it is in the CDD and part of a community that's asked, being asked to, to take on this burden, it serves a, a vital ecological uh, function for Southeast Lee County. And I urge that we um, find some way to uh, assist the community in um, not only uh, recovering um, what they lost in the storm, but building future resilience. If that means you know more geofabrics, more innovative techniques, engineering solutions that we can put into place to make sure that that vital service is being protected. Um, I would just like to get status on those two items for future funding. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, does anyone else wish to speak on item number one this time? Okay, seeing none. Move the item. I'll close public comment. Uh, we have a motion to approve from I'll Commissioner Pendergrass, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Uh, is there any further discussion? Uh, Commissioner? Could, uh, Cecilia explained the three that are in gray, just how they ranked the way they did, and just a little bit more detail. Obviously, there's an item for Greater Pine Island. Um, I'm somewhat surprised that the low to moderate income activity wouldn't be met or the application wouldn't be met. So maybe you could enlighten me. Yes, sir. Uh, so, Commissioner Ruane, the with the Salus Care request, two things on that one. The the request is to essentially demolish the Ortiz uh, campus and rebuild, and that will be multiples of the $50 million request, and there is not a financing plan in place to, to fund the balance of that project. That's number one. Number two, we are undertaking a continuum of care implementation study for behavioral health with CDBGDR funding. And when that plan is complete, it will recommend where we think investments should be made. So we would, we would recommend waiting the outcome of that study. Um, for the Blue Lake CDD, we do have hundreds of CDDs and HOAs across the county who are still dealing with damaged infrastructure from Hurricane Ian. You'll remember the county did apply on, on many of their behalves for state funding. So we are trying to help them pursue other avenues. The reality for CDBGDR with, with this CDD and most of them in particular is, to the commissioner's point, there's no low moderate income benefit. Uh, these would be mitigation projects of which we have a very limited amount that we can do under CDBGDR. And so quite honestly, there's probably a hundred of these communities that would want to submit applications and the reality of them being funded are, are next to nothing. 
and then third on the Greater Pine Island Community Center. The maximum award through this NOFA is $50 million. It's a $165 million estimated project. Again, there's, there's, there's no plan for what would fill that gap, and there's no site selected. There's no site control, et cetera. So it just, it's just not ripe yet. I hope that answers the question. The follow-up, um, that's great. I, I was just surprised that uh, the Greater Pine Island you know, in the low to moderate income activity was a no. Just surprised at the answer, that's all. I understand your explanation about the 50,000, 165, would have thought that would have been a yes for that area, not a no. That was just the only surprise in the chart. That was my question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any follow-up, any further discussion? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a question just on the, um, so the amount of the total recommended projects that we're, um, we're talking about here is 259 million. Um, what what is the total amount available uh, for this for these grants? It, Commissioner, it's about 229 million total. Uh, we've got 129 million for the critical infrastructure component and 100 million for the public facilities component. So, when you add all of the city applications to these, uh, we're going to be dramatically oversubscribed for for the infrastructure funding. Okay, so we'll have far more grant requests than we can fund. What can you just kind of briefly hit the process again? How we'll uh, evaluate the grants and, and how this these decisions will be made? Yes, sir. Uh, so all of the applications submitted by the May twenty fourth deadline will be evaluated by staff and our um, and our um, vendors for technical compliance with the notices of funding availability. Make sure they're eligible score them according to the criteria that were contained in the notice, uh, the NOFAs that you uh, published earlier. Um, that package will be forwarded to your evaluation committee. Uh, they will presumably ask questions of the applicants, perhaps even take some presentations, make their evaluations. Um, I do want to note that, that their recommendations will be impacted by the limitations of CDBGDR, which goes back to low moderate income benefit the amount of mitigation funding that's available to us, et cetera. So they're gonna to have to really piece together a lot, of, a lot of things. They will ultimately make a recommendation to this board, so you'll see where the staff evaluations came in, you'll see what your, your evaluation committee's recommendations are, and then ultimately this board will make awards. Okay, great, and then the entire time uh, line of all that, how, how long do you expect all of this to take? When will, we, when will it be in front of the board? We anticipate coming back to the board in August for your decision on ultimate awards. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Commissioner Ryan. To follow up and great question, Commissioner Hammond. Um, this really goes back to what we were actually allocated as opposed to what our unmet need is. I'm sure if we were successful in expanding that unmet need, we're getting close to the unmet need from the one to the nine billion that we submitted. Some of these projects obviously might be more eligible. And then secondarily, that's what I had indicated why I thought there was a need for the workshop because there is a great gap between what we were allocated at 1.1 and what we submitted, which was over 9 billion. The 8 billion is going to allow more projects as we advocate, and that's our job to make sure we advocate for that. That was the reason for the questions, but appreciate the oversubscription. Um, the other issue that I I'm aware of, at least, and correct me if I'm wrong, Glenn, please. Um, we may roll some of these out. They may or may not necessarily come to fruition. We may then have to shift to a different project. Is that a possibility? Yes, sir. Okay. You know, that's basically what took place in Sandy and many other storms. You have different projects that seem like they're ripe, and then for whatever reason, they don't come together. So you have to shift money constantly. That's why we developed a property from uh, Irma uh, over in Cape Coral. I mean, that's how long these projects lay, la last around. So just FYI. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Any further discussion? No. Okay, seeing none, uh, we have a recommendation for approval of Commissioner Pendergrass, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Are there any objections? Seeing no objections, uh, item moved uh, unanimously. Mr. Harner, please introduce item number two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is to launch CDBGDR affordable housing development new construction programs, and I'd like to ask Ms. Jeannie Sutton to present the item. Good morning, Commissioners. 
This item releases two NOFAs effective today for the creation of new affordable housing units. These will release about $50 million for new construction of single family housing for future homeowners and uh, 150 million of new construction or acquisition rehabilitation to create affordable multifamily rental units. These applications will be available for public housing authorities, units of general local government if they choose, as well as for-profit and non-profit housing developers. Applications will be due back on June 26th and we hope to bring these funding recommendations back to you all in September of this year. All right, uh, at this time, do we have any questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner Wayne. Maybe it's my misremembering, but I thought the allocation was going to be for new construction of 300 million, not 200. You are correct. So there was $50 million released previously for multifamily uh, rehabilitation, so rehabilitation of impacted units and then there is a hundred million dollars remaining so that will be either released in a future nofa or be used to award projects if these nofas are oversubscribed okay i just thank you for the clarity i mm -hmm. thought i had 300 million in my head and i lost 100 million so <laughs> okay. thank you, commissioner uh any other questions for staff at this time no all right i'll call for public comment would anyone uh like to speak on item number two No one? Okay, at this time I will close public comment. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Move the item. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Pendergrass, second from Commissioner Wayne. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Uh, any objections? Seeing no objections, item number two moves unanimously. Mr. Harner, please introduce item number three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This item is to approve um, Florida Department of Transportation funding agreement for Burnt Store Road North, and I'd like to ask Mr. Price to present the item. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this item is to execute a local funding agreement with FDOT to advance the ongoing PD&E study for Burnt Store Road North from Van Buren Street to the Charlotte County line uh, from 30% to 60% plans, including the creation of a design-build criteria package uh, this approval will also assign $2.5 million of county monies to the existing PD&E study uh, being, con being performed by FDOT and will establish a $1 million right-of-way budget so county lands can begin acquiring necessary rights-of-way uh, to build the project. And we're here for any questions. Okay. Uh, commissioners, at this time, do we have any questions? I'll, move, yeah, second. I'll, I'll second it. Thank you. We have a motion to approve from Commissioner Wayne, a second from... Commissioner Hammond, uh, at this time I'll open up for public comment. Does anyone wish to speak on item number three? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, any further discussion from the board? Uh, just Commissioner comment, Sandel. Uh, having been to the recent MPO meeting up there, I mean, we have challenges everywhere, but uh, that's a community that's vitally important. And so advancing this is, uh, is everybody's best. Thank you. Uh, any other comment? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Rain, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Are there any objections? Seeing no objections, item number three moves. Uh, that concludes the administrative agenda. Uh, so at this time, we will move to public hearing agenda. There are three items. County Attorney, please introduce public hearing item number one. Good morning, Commissioners. David Halverson, County Attorney's Office. I have your first two public hearings this morning. These items have, have been duly advertised and I provided the affidavits of publication to the clerk. <laughs> Item one is a petition to vacate the public's interest in a portion of an unimproved 50-foot wide platted right-of-way located north of 2500 Floyd Avenue South, which is a platted lot in the subdivision of Lehigh Acres. There are no objections to the request of vacation. And uh, if there's any questions, staff's available. Uh, Commissioner, do we have any questions for staff on item one? I'll move approval, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'll second. We have approval, Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Sandelli. Uh, I will open up for public comment. Does anyone wish to speak on item number one? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, is there any other uh, questions or comments from staff? Okay, seeing none, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Sandelli. Any objections? 
Seeing no objections, item number one, Lucy Namsley, County Attorney, please introduce public hearing item number two. Thank you. Item two is a request to adopt an ordinance modifying the boundaries of the Esplanade Lake Club Community Development District. The petitioner would like to add approximately 46.29 acres of contiguous land to the CDD, thereby modifying the district's external boundary. The request meets the requirements of Chapter 190 Florida Statutes and is also consistent with the Lee Comprehensive Plan. Uh, staff has no objection to the petitioner's request and a copy of the original petition has been submitted to the clerk. Um, if there's any questions, uh, staff's available. Any questions for staff? I move the item. I'll second it. Okay, we have approval from Commissioner uh, Pendergrass, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Uh, at this time, I'll open up for public comment on item number two. Does anyone wish to make comment on item number two? Please step up and uh, state your name, please. And Good morning, my name is Wes Haber. I'm with the law firm of QTAC Rock. I represent the CDD and just here to answer any questions if there are any, no affirmative presentation otherwise. Okay, does anyone have any questions this time? Okay, anyone from public like to make comment? Marcellus? Thank you, um, Marsha Ellis, for the record. Um, just uh, in terms of the uh, that, that section of Aliko, I know that um, this is adding some extra lots, which means uh, more impermeable surface, more water running off, more management of, of, of all that water uh, in, in the Estero Basin, um, and then uh, you know also uh, at the split, 10 miles, it's very dynamic there. We have three watersheds, so I just ask that um, when, when we increase the density and we increase the intensity of uses that we make sure that we're being protective of our water and allowing enough open space that um, to mitigate uh, the development and uh, so that we don't run into flooding issues. We already do have pooling water on Alico around the Esplanade area. Um, and historically, we know we have a great deal of sheet flow. So I just um, cautioned that we continue to strive to balance those conflicting concerns for an outcome that's in um, the interest of not just new folks that are moving in there, but the existing community. Uh, would you like to, uh, any, any other public comment at this time? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. And I would just note the CDD is merely a, a funding mechanism, an operation mechanism, so we don't impact the development that would take place in the community. This isn't a development approval in any way whatsoever. It's just expanding the boundary over that area should it get approved. If it's not already approved, it may be for those lots. It would happen either way. The CDD just provides a mechanism for better managing the types of issues that the comment raises. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, at this time, uh, we have a motion to approve Commissioner Pendergrass, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Any further discussion? I'd like to thank the applicant for expanding their, uh, their CDD there. This is being paid for by the owners or residents of that community. It's a beautiful community. Thank you for building there. Those mining lakes, it's a beautiful area, so continue to grow in the area. Thank you. Any other comments? Or? Nope. All right, seeing none, uh, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Pendergrass, second from Commissioner Hammond. Any objections? Seeing no objections, item moves unanimously. Mr. County Attorney, please introduce item number three. Good morning, Commissioners. Oh. My name is Andrea Fraser from the County Attorney's Office. I have your number three public hearing, which is to repeal Ordinance 0720. Um, I have reviewed the affidavit of publication and find it legally sufficient informant content to proceed with the hearing at this time. Commissioners, do we have any questions for staff at this time? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, sure. I, I think this one definitely warrants explanation, uh, you know, uh, from our staff. Uh, I think they gave us all really good briefings beforehand on, on this one. But uh, if uh, Mr. Harner, if you want to explain just kind of why, why the need for the repeal and the new administrative code now. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Avis to uh, come up and present the other. Good morning, Commissioners. Benjamin Avis, Public Safety. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, explain the action that we're asking uh, you to take this morning to repeal <clears throat> Ordinance 720. Uh, obviously, this dates back 17 years ago, and there have been a number of changes, not only within uh, how we manage emergencies, but also across the community. So there are a couple of really key considerations uh, when reviewing this ordinance. First, the Disaster Advisory Council, which is contained within the ordinance, uh, needs to change and adjust to the current needs of the community. 
Uh, right now, as an example, the village of Estero is not represented in the ordinance, so technically they do not have a seat on the Disaster Advisory uh, Council. That would be addressed, and your Consent 21 item this morning uh, would enact an administrative code that would replace the Disaster Advisory Council should you take the action to repeal the ordinance this morning. Uh, secondly, there are a number of items in this ordinance that deal with recovery planning, and since then, we have had changes to the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. We've also had the release of two FEMA frameworks for recovery. Uh, all of those really advance uh, a lot of the work that we would do post-disaster, uh, and I think we've seen how a lot of that work is really shaped by the individual nature of each of those emergencies, whether it's Irma uh, or Hurricane Ian. Uh, we've seen how those disasters are unique, and so they require unique approaches. And then finally, uh, there are a number of conflicts between this ordinance and other ordinances or plans. And so by repealing the ordinance, it would eliminate those uh, conflicts or duplication of language in, in multiple areas. Uh, commissioners, any other questions for staff at this time? Just you know, <coughs> one follow-up question. I think maybe the attorney's office would, would answer this. What are the benefits of going with the uh, administrative code over a new ordinance or an admitted <coughs> ordinance? Mr. Chairman? Uh, uh, Mr. County Attorney, please. Uh, several, um, not the least of which is a, a more rapid ability to respond to necessary changes. Administrative codes are adopted by the board. Uh, ordinance changes take a, a longer period of time uh, to process through the, the required notification systems. Um, but I think the, the major takeaway here is part of what you've charged your staff with doing consistently is looking at duplication of regulations, and, and that's the driving force behind today's requested action, is there are numerous layers of regulations dealing with this subject matter. This one has become outdated, and it, it simply needs to be repealed. Uh, the subject matter is dealt with adequately through either other ordinances or other administrative codes, so this is superfluous at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, I will call for public uh, comment on item number three. Uh, Marcellus? Thank you. Um, just for transparency's sake, because I, I was confused as well and wanted to understand better the relationship between the administrative code and the advantages between that and the ordinance, is it would be extremely helpful if, if this were a little bit of a tighter uh, item where we could have the administrative code and the ordinances and then the things that are related as well because I'm hearing from uh, uh, County Attorney Wesh that there are there's overlap and related items that sort of, of tie into this if those could just sort of you know for transparency purposes be reviewed to see what language is 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 being stricken what's being uh, what's duplicated and being um, uh, taken um, over by, by the, it, it would just be really helpful to understand how it fits in within this broader, it, you know, recovery picture. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Uh, anyone like to speak at this time on item number three? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment. Uh, do we have a motion uh, to move the item? I'll move approval, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, we have it. approval from, move the item, Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Sandelli. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, any objections? Seeing no objections, item number three moves unanimously. Uh, that concludes our public hearings for today. Uh, so we'll move on to walk-ons and carryovers. Uh, there are no walk-ons or carryovers. Okay, then we'll move on to commissioner items. Commissioner Hammond, do you have any items? I have no items today, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Pendergrass? No, I do Commissioner Sandelli? No. Commissioner Romain? No. I have none. That concludes Commissioner Items. Uh, moving to committee appointments. Commissioner Hammond, do you have any committee appointments? I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have, a, uh, I have three new appointments and one reappointment today. The first new appointment is Christina Mumford to the Alabama Grove Lighting Unit. Uh, the next new appointment is Dr. Joseph Buhain to the Veterans Advisory Committee and Armando Hernandez to the Veterans Advisory Committee, and then finally a reappointment of Allison Gruber to the Parks and Recreation Services Committee. Second. All right. We have a motion from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Wayne. Any objections? 
No objection. Motion carries unanimously. Commissioner Pendergrass, do you have any? Yes, I have four. And the first one would be a new reappointment of Roger Triphauser of the Veterans Advisory Committee, a new appointment with John Thomas, Veterans Advisory Committee, a new appointment for Kevin Bessler of the CBDG RDR Planning Infrastructure Committee, and Michael Smith reappointment, Sunset Cove Operation and Maintenance, MSTBU. Okay. Uh, I'll second it. Uh, Commissioner Pendergrass, motion to approve. Uh, Second from Commissioner Greenwell. Uh, any further discussion? Any objections? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Commissioner Sandelli, do you have any? Yes, sir. I've got uh, two uh, new appointments. Uh, first is Stephanie Nurok for the Veterans Advisory Committee. And the second one is a new uh, uh, for the Veterans Advisory Committee, uh, Marion Spain. Okay. I'll we second that. Okay, we have motion from Commissioner Sandelli, a second from Commissioner Ham Hammond. Any objections? No objections. Moves unanimously. Commissioner Wayne. I have one reappointment and two new appointments. The reappointment is Missy Nichols to Parks and Rec Services. The new appointments are Tim Cook as well as Chris Camarada to the Veterans Advisory Committee. I'll second that. Okay, we have a uh, motion from Commissioner Wayne, a second from Commissioner Hammond. Any objections? No objections. Moves unanimously. I have three appointments that need a motion and a second. I would like to appoint Stephen Epkins and Gerald Harvey to the Veterans Advisory Committee and reappointment of Orville Hall to the Parks and Recreation Committee. Uh, do we have a motion? So motion. A, a, second. A motion from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Pendergrass. Any objections? Nope. Seeing none, moves, uh, that, uh, moves unanimously. That concludes the committee appointments. Uh, county manager, uh, moving to the county manager item, Mr. Harner, do you have any items? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have two items today. <clears throat> the first being an appointment to the Babcock Ranch Preserve Advisory Group. Um, we received a email from the Florida, For Florida Forest Service asking us to fill that vacancy. We would like to make the recommendation of Becky Swigert as the appointee. She's from Community Development. And Lisa Weaver from Parks and Recreation as the alternate. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion to approve from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Pendergrass. Uh, we'll call for public comment. Is there any public comment on this item? Seeing no public comment, I will close public comment. We have a motion to approve from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner <laughs> Pendergrass. Um, any discussions or objections? No objections. Item moves unanimously. Uh, Mr. County Manager, uh, do you have any other items? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the second item we have today is regarding FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program. We'd like to provide you with an update. Um, as we discussed previously, we received a call from FEMA last Thursday, and they had stated that the incorporated portion of Lee County um, was receiving a retrograde to the CRS class 10. We were previously a five which um, gave us a 25% discount. This was due, based on comments from them, due to a large amount of unpermitted work, failure to issue substantial damage, termination compliance, and program deficiencies. This program, or this um, retrograde, would take effect October 1st. The earliest that we could get back into the program would be April of 26 and it would not take effect until October of 26. Um, the decision was made on March 8th. We were notified on March 28th. Um, based on the discussion that we had with them, they, they stated that this was a final decision and that there were no appeals available to us. In the conversation, they also informed us that they had updated all the congressional offices prior to meeting with us and the municipalities. So besides unincorporated Lee County, the city of Cape Coral, the city of Benita Springs, the village of Estero, and the town of Fort Myers Beach were all provided the same information and were all retrograded to a CRS class 10, all of which were fives before. Um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to discuss a few things that um, I believe there's some comments out in the media and there's other comments being made that, that aren't completely correct and we'd like to provide the information to update the community on what we did and what we're continuing to do. More specifically, I'd like to ask Mr. Mora to talk about 
the, the, the three items that they submitted that were um, discussion details of concern, which was the large amount of unpermitted work, failure to use substantial damage determination, compliance, and some of the program deficiencies. <coughs> um, I, uh, there was, and I'm going to turn to him in a second, but there was a couple of comments regarding the fact that of no, how we notice the community, and I will provide that as uh, when Mark is done. And secondly, the, the major issue of st substantial damage compliance. So I'm going to turn <coughs> over to Mark, and then I'll take over from there. Mark? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. You're recognized. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to address some of the concerns that Dave surfaced. I did want to bring us back to the context in which our team worked in 18 months ago uh, across the county. There was over 100,000 homes affected by the storm. And as soon as travel was deemed to be safe, our team, in partnership with USAR, Army Corps of Engineers, and our municipalities, began to do some assessments. And these initial assessments were something termed as windshield assessments. It's basically teams going out observing the damage across the county. You guys might all recall we created a dashboard or a map kind of indicating where the damages occurred. Um, those assessments that we, we completed, we did consult with other municipalities about what their actions would be after the, after the storm passed. We also checked in with Naples, Collier County, and Sarasota County. As far as we know, they did the same type of assessment post-storm that we did. Um, so when we did these assessments, we obviously didn't enter people's homes or do any type of um, structural assessment of their home and the damages that they sustained. But you got to understand what type of teams we sent into the field. The Army Corps provided volunteers. We did have help from USAR and the municipalities and our own team of building inspectors and code enforcement agents were part of the assessment process. In order to do a substantial damage assessment, you do need to have skilled professionals that are trained to perform that type of assessment. And they have to get inside structures, homes, in order to do a thorough assessment. And basically what they're trying to do is establish the cost of repair to a home and really implementing the 50% rule to see if that cost meets the threshold established by the value of their home. So at that time, we were not doing that level of inspection. We're simply going out trying to identify areas that sustain the most damage so that we could focus our efforts on recovery. So at that time, the county did get assistance, as I mentioned, from the Army Corps of Engineers as well as USAR. And we also repurposed our, our team as well. Shortly after the storm, we did receive a crush of permit applications. Obviously, people wanted to repair their home. We repurposed our building inspectors, and they started to work on issuing permits. So we had to make that decision to shift our resources to better serve our community and their needs. The substantial damage assessments that we did create were one, if a resident wanted us to do it, or two, at the time of permitting. They would bring in a, a permit application. There was a process in which we determined whether or not the repair met that 50% threshold. And at that point, they were, had to, to either de demolish their home or they had to pull a permit to bring the new construction up to current code. So that's kind of what we did. Um, I know FEMA's emails back and forth between us wanted to clarify our actions on certain structures and certain residences. And I think you will find in our timeline that we provided that staff resp responded in a timely manner and provided all the information that was requested uh, in regards to these structures. Thank you, Mark. Um, and with that being said, I'd like to go over the timeline and talk about how we handled a number of the situations, specifically the three letters that have been outlined, um, and clarify some of the misinformation that uh, I believe was presented last night on the media. Um, February 8th of 2023, a letter from FEMA informing Lee County of retaining CRS class five status. So they were, we were receiving the letter stating that you have met the criteria to be, um, to keep the class five status. On February 14th, a letter um, from FEMA questioning Lee property appraiser value, value determination and encouraging Lee County to use methods other than the product created by the property uh, appraiser. Um, on Fe March 7th, a site visit from FEMA. On March 22nd, a letter from FEMA retracting statements made um, regarding our um, methods of determination by the property appraiser. Um, on June 7th, we received another letter from FEMA requesting information. 
On July 7th, Lee County responds to that June 7th letter fulfilling the request of information. On July 12th, email from FEMA confirming receipt of that response. September 22nd, phone request from FEMA for additional information. September 25, Lee County response to uh, requested information. December 6th, letter from FEMA requesting additional information. January 11th, email response with attachments to FEMA. Um, FEMA's request for information on March or January 12th, an email from FEMA acknowledging that receipt that they received those documents. On January 30th, an email from FEMA in follow up to Lee County um, response requesting additional documents. On January 30th and 31st, email response with attachments to FEMA request for information. February 29th, emails between FEMA and Lee County requesting additional information updates regarding recovery process. On March 11th, there were emails between FEMA and Lee County requesting information and clarification. Last email to FEMA requesting clarification regarding data that FEMA is interpreting and we received no response. So uh, that is a really important timeline to, to show that we did provide voluminous amounts of information and continue to beyond the dates that I uh, stated here. There were a number of emails back and forth regarding information and information requests. At no time were we notified that we were in jeopardy of being retrograded. Um, it was if you failed to comply with the information request, you could face a retrograde. Typically, there's a lot more communication between us and the federal government, and specifically FEMA and these type of activities. Um, our expectation, along with the municipalities, would be the assumption that there would be some type of a warning, a direct warning that you are in violation or you are close to losing your CRS rating and this is what you need to do. At no time did we get an email that said you need to do A, B, and C in order not to lose that CRS rating. I think another piece of information that um, I like to share as well is I believe there was a comment uh, of concern regarding how we notified the community. We made, an, we made a decision um, early on that we weren't going to put out flyers or send out emails to homes because if you take an, an example of Matt Lachey, not only were their homes gone, but a, a good portion of their property was gone. So it, was, it would be very difficult to send out those type of notifications to people. The concerted effort that was used was the county used up-to-date uh, immediate forms of communication that were readily, readily available to a broad audience of res residents. We learned from Hurricane Irma that showed digital communications was effective. Many residents were displaced from their permanent residences and did not have easy access to traditional, as I stated, traditional mail or multiple means. We relied on a lot of efforts that we did, again, from, from Irma, where people were not able to, didn't have power and didn't have access to mail that they were getting communication from people outside of our area, family members, friends, communicating to them some of the information that we were laying out to our community. Social media posts related to flooding, permitting, and available FEMA resources engaged over 20,000 residents immediately following the hurricane. So all this happened within a three-month time frame following the hurricane. And then local media, local media outlets immediately shared permitting information from news releases, both on air and through their digital platforms. These actions, account, uh, these actions by the county took um, address the public notice of substantial damage, the 50% rule, and the need to get permits. So uh, I hope this helps with some of the communication that's out there that the county did not was not proactive and that the county did not um, did not meet the request for information um, that we had from FEMA. So if you have any questions, uh, my staff's available to discuss any of those issues. Okay. Commissioners. Yeah questions or comments at this time yeah I mean I have some mr. chairman uh, if, if that's okay so um, well, you know throughout this entire process one of the things that you know every time I met with county staff and county administration and and really tried to ask how can we help recover faster how can we help people rebuild their homes faster how can we rebuild some of our infrastructure that's damaged faster I was told two things by county administration routinely number one I was told well we can't repair this infrastructure faster because we need FEMA to reimburse us for it and we've got to go through the FEMA process, which we had consultants and, and everybody helping us with. The other thing we were told was, no, we have to do the rebuild this way and the permitting this way 
Otherwise, we risk losing our CRS rating. So this was something that was extremely top of mind with county administration throughout the entire rebuild. I mean, I, I, I can tell you, there was more than one occasion that I heard, we have to do it this way or else we risk losing our CRS rating. Um, I think, you know, the, the interesting timing on all of this is we're getting this notice from FEMA now two, almost like year and a half, two years after the storm when things are calm and really our community is well on its way to being rebuilt. Um, <clears throat> now you can go back and say, well, boy, you know, looking in the immediate aftermath of the storm, you didn't follow this procedure right or whatever they're alleging here. Um, you got to remember where we were at that time. People were displaced. Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced from their homes. FEMA didn't have enough hotel rooms to put everybody in. People were all over the place. We were trying to help, help people navigate this process. Um, the one thing that I, I noticed we did different with the FEMA reimbursements is we did hire a consultant whose job it is to track all of that paperwork and that reporting. Do we have a consultant whose job it was to help us with the substantial damage reporting and going through this whole audit process that FEMA's putting us through on this? No, Commissioner, we do have a floodplain manager that it works with FEMA, and uh, I think Mark can give you the details about what our floodplain play manager is required to have to be our floodplain manager. But each municipality, each entity has their own floodplain manager that works with FEMA directly. And, and Mark, would you like to add anything to that? No, Dave, you're correct. We do have a floodplain manager, and there is a team that works on these efforts post storm and works in blue skies as well, because this is something we work on maintaining throughout the year. Uh, so, community development took the lead on it. Not to say that <clears throat> the approach of using a consultant in the future, uh, it probably should be considered in order to kind of buttress what we have on our team now. What about this scenario? Um, is there an opportunity for us to now at least, hopefully FEMA, have, have they said, is FEMA going to, they've given us nothing in writing so far? They've given us nothing to review? That is correct. Um, in, our, in our conversation last week, they said sometime in mid-April we would receive documentation. Do we have time to hire a consultant who can review whatever they're saying we, we whatever they're alleging, right? Uh, and then hopefully go through our paperwork and our responses and, and hopefully get this straightened out and corrected? Uh, is there a consultant out there that does that kind of work? Is there an opportunity to maybe do that? I believe we would not have the time, if it was in the middle of this month, we would not have time to get a, a vendor on in two weeks to be able to do that before their determination. I mean, I think that's something that we should look at potentially, uh, commissioners, you know, I mean, it just, it sounds like to me we have, I'll bet we have the information. We must not have given it to them the way they liked, I don't know, uh, but it, it, you know, our, our team can tell us how many homes came in for permits. Our team can tell us how many homes were demolished and rebuilt. Um, if this is just information that they needed provided to them in a different way, then uh, then maybe somebody will help us translate that into a way that FEMA can understand. But th those are my thoughts. Uh, Commissioner Hamm, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pendergast. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Ham. I think one thing you were leading to was also, is there a pill process for this? Because I think when I talked to staff last week, and there's no pill process for this. That is correct. That's unfortunate, Commissioner Ham. Like you said, we've been sitting here the last 16 months talking about everything from um, fills fill lights the roads and bridges and and traffic signals being replaced and here we are waiting we kept being told by the federal government this is the process you go through to get reimbursement and we are getting that so i know staff's been really attentive to that we've been really attentive to that everything from the you know little league fills to everything else we've been waiting and we still got traffic lights down waiting for that process and it's just frustrating because we talked about that before a year ago six months after the storm we had 12,000 applications for housing and we had 48 people placed in housing Meanwhile, so you're seeing the results of a failed administration in the D.C. side. You're seeing the failed administration of the FEMA where, you know, here is the citizens. We are the ones that are suffering. We are being displaced. We're being hurt because, you know, six months after the storm, we talked about it here many days where we had 12,000 people and there's hundreds of trailers setting up 17 off in the fields to wait for somebody to place them, but they wouldn't place anybody in the housing. But they, you know, championed, surely they had 48 people placed out of 12,643 people. So it's just frustrating because we were told one thing, and then when it comes down to it, we're told, no, you can't have it now. And the citizens are going to have to pay more for insurance if they choose to live in an area that's a floodplain, which is unfortunate. And when I talked to my contacts in D.C. on Friday, they basically said it's, it's unfortunate, but it sounds like, you know, 
Florida people, their attitude is pretty much, if you want to live in Florida, you're going to pay the price. And this is unfortunate. It's, being, it's almost like revenge politics. And I hate seeing that two words being used, but that's what seems like it's happening. It's very unfortunate because at the end of the day, our citizens, our taxpayers are being held hostage here and having to pay more for that. Thank you. Mr. Pendergrass, I, I have a quick comment. Um, this seems like a classic of uh, our federal government saying we're here to help. <laughs> Are you? That's my question. Are you? Commissioner Sandelli. Um, I think we're all disappointed by what happened recently. I go through and I look at things a certain way. The first thing is we talk a lot about paperwork and going back and developing some of this. We talk about process. We've talked about this before. Process takes time and frustrates everybody. The most important thing is people. What we're really talking about here is people. If you go back and look at the scope of this disaster, it affected so many of us in this community in so many ways. It's about the people side. Our first charge was to find people after the storm and account for the people. Citizens deserve that. Their families deserve that. Um, and we had to provide basic services before we could do anything. And so before we started rebuilding, you know, it was the same group of people that was most affected that we were counting on to bring this process back. And, um, you know, in Fort Myers Beach is in my district. I spent an awful lot of time there near as many of you have and stuff like that. City Hall was gone. People were gone. Process was gone. So that's where we started, you know. And so while we talk about retroactively where the stuff goes, we're losing the fact that this is about the people that we represent, our homes, our families, and so on and so forth. And that's where I can get a little tight. <laughs> so. yes, sir. Commissioner Wayne. Sure, thank you. Um, First and foremost, thanks for the information. I think it was really, really helpful. Um, approximately, Mark, if you had a guess, how many people actually did we have on your team when you talk about help we got from Army Corps, help from other ballpark? Uh, at the height of doing these uh, initial inspections, I would say upwards to 50. Uh, the Army Corps really did supplement our team. And we had our, all of our building inspectors as well as our code enforcement agents out in the field as well. So the county was represented by at least 25 staff members. And then the municipalities also worked with USAR and the Army Corps, and they had staff working as well. So all told, about 50 people trying to canvass the whole county at that time. So 50 people, um, I remember talking with Matt Caldwell early in the process and heard over 100,000 parcels were damaged. I'm not talking about street lights. I'm not talking about stop signs. I'm not talking about traffic lights. I'm not talking about anything. It was, we're just talking about mass um, amount of, of, of volume we have to do. Um, it just seems like the task from a Category 5, it didn't seem like we had all this abundance of help from the federal government at all. Um, you know, 50 people, 100,000 parcels. You know, listen, nobody was prepared for, you know, communication being ineffective. Understand what the county manager said. You know, there were times you couldn't get your cell phone out, depending on where you were, if it was on Sanibel. We actually went out and got them, you know, devices that uh, Mr. Musk put together to make sure we communicate. So communication was challenged in more ways than we ever anticipated. Um, obviously, volume of what we had to review. Um, I came here 20 years ago, and unlike this storm, Charlie was easier where we can go around and look at dwellings and get inside and do whatever, but you're not talking about the same magnitude. You're talking about a magnitude that's just, um, you know, obviously just insurmountable to try to deal with 50 people. Um, appreciate all the actions. Um, this package is really important, and I'm really glad you got that. It's unfortunate that you know all the particular media channels indicated that the commissioners got these letters and didn't do anything about it. Um, with the exception of today, I'm not really aware of these letters and or communications. And it's not our job to do that, okay? Our job is to manage, obviously, the four people we have, not necessarily to be there micromanaging this. Um, and this is no different than Michael getting 100% reimbursement, the people up in Storm Michael getting 100% reimbursement from FEMA for debris cleanup, and that was a category, whatever that was. And we have a category five with you know, a 15 foot storm surge, and we get less days than they got. Again, different administrations, but the reimbursement, we had to, if you all recall, 
Commissioner Hammond, you and I went up and we had to advocate for the, the particular amount that the county would have had to split with the state relative to debris cleanup. So just there's so many inequalities associated with this. This is just unfortunate because the citizens of Lee County are going to feel this in ways that we don't have the ability, as you said, to appeal. I'd love to try to at least learn from this, and maybe we don't have the time to react, but I do believe on some of your comments, Commissioner Hammond, it's something we need to learn from. So getting someone in the consulting range wouldn't be, you know, it's hindsight, but it's certainly going to be good for subsequent administration, county commissioners. Yeah, I appreciate the comments. Mr. Chairman, may I? Yeah, I, Commissioner Hammond. I, 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 um, I, I've heard the comment a couple times that there's no appeal available to us. I just don't accept that, not in right. America, not where we believe in due process here. So um, I, I am curious to hear from our county attorney about do we have legal avenues here to try and um, you know, interrupt and suspend this process of uh, increases that they're going to rain down on us? Mr. Chairman? Please, Mr. County Attorney. Last time I checked, we do not live in a dictatorship. Everybody has somebody above them, with the exception of perhaps the U.S. Supreme Court, the president, some other offices. What we've been provided with here, interesting observation, 18 plus months after the storm, Thursday afternoon before the Easter Sunday holiday, we get a phone call that substantially impacts our, our community. Everybody's phone started ringing. You, the Board of County Commissioners has made it abundantly clear to your staff the significance of this issue. Our first step is to open, I believe, a dialogue with FEMA. The comment that this decision is final, there's no appeal, that's not our system of government. Just as we had to find the right level of decision maker once before, when FEMA was incorrect in their assertion and understanding of Florida law, which involved the a tremendous amount of help of our property appraiser that was referred to earlier, this also cries out for that type of attempt. You got, the board has already given us the direction that we are to do that. We are in the process of assimilating information. Commissioners, as you recall, in that last instance, uh, it became clear to us that the Atlanta FEMA field office lacked a basic understanding of the taxation structure and the impact of homestead exemption law in Florida. And it took us, with the cooperation of the property appraiser, to get to the D.C. FEMA office to make them understand and make them understand that their initial decision was wrong and had to be reversed and was reversed. This is somewhat analogous, in my humble opinion, of a complex math problem. And we all heard in high school geometry, show me your work. Don't, you can't just put your answer down. What we have so far from FEMA is their answer. We have to see their work. What was their decision based on? And we're entitled to that, and that's what we're going to pursue. It would not be the first time a federal agency it would not be the first time a federal agency was incorrect. We understand the significance of the issue to the people of Lee County, and we will remind FEMA that your constituents, our fellow residents, are also constituents of FEMA and the federal government. And whether it be through a discussion resolution, mediation, arbitration, or litigation, we will have a discussion with FEMA to see their math. And we will report back to you and keep you informed accordingly. And if it becomes necessary to seek approval from this board to exercise certain rights that we might have as a community, we have no hesitancy to ask you for that permission, and we'll do so. But I think in the interim, the first step is to at least open up a dialogue with somebody at the proper level, whether it be Atlanta or Washington, and ask them to see their math. We'll show them 
our math and maybe we can come to some type of reasoned conclusion that's not based on some star chamber procedure that here's our final decision it's carved in granite live with it there's no appeal there's no discussion that's not the way the system works you don't tolerate it from your staff here and i don't think we as a community need to tolerate it from our federal government either <clears throat> On that note, do you need any direction from the board? Because it looks like we have, we're going to be fighting with FEMA. So do you need direction from the board to continue our fight for our local residents? Mr. Chairman, yes, sir, Mr. if Chairman. the board would like to put that in the form of a motion, that's fine. Um, I would ask that you not put any direction toward litigation at this point because it might um, actually be counterproductive. Mediation. But um, certainly direction to your staff to reaffirm the importance of this issue and direct us to take steps as may be necessary to get clarification and then keep you informed. If we fail in our attempts, we can always come back and seek further authority. Is it County Manager uh, um, Mr. County Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we would like to, you know, based off what Richard was saying, we would like to request the board to send a letter to FEMA um, for a full debrief um, for all the documentation that, that they use to make a decision and a, and a request for an appeal process as well. Thank you. I mean, I will make that motion. I think that's a fantastic motion to make. Um, would that, Mr. Chairman, uh, would that include, Mr. Harner, going to Washington or Atlanta to have a face-to-face -face meeting with these folks to try and talk about this? I think all means available to us, yes. Yeah. We would be willing, you know, uh, to go to D.C. I think that would be the appropriate. I, I believe in our previous history, we, we appealed to D.C. with the Atlanta decision on the 50 percent rule. So I believe just going to D.C. would might be the, in our best interest in working with our federal lobbyists in that process. Yeah, I mean, because my thought is, look, we, you know, we've had phone calls, we've had letters. Clearly something's getting lost in translation. Let's just sit down and talk about this. This is an issue of tremendous magnitude to our county. It's something that, like I said, we were reminded along the way we have to do all these things this way in order to keep our CRS rating. So clearly it was a priority for us to keep our CRS rating. What happened here that, that you're now taking it away from us? So uh, I'll make that motion. If, okay. um, Would you mind maybe perhaps just expanding that motion a little bit? Love the letter, love the idea, love the fact that we potentially go, but I want to, to direct staff to have all twos they deem necessary including but not limited to whatever actions we need to take to obviously come to a conclusion. I just want it clear for the public that we will do a letter, we'll do visits, we'll do whatever is necessary to come to the conclusion. And I just want to make sure there's total clarity for the record that we're looking to look at all aspects and give staff all the tools necessary. And let them use those. Tools. Yeah, I'll, I'll amend my motion as, as such, as all tools. And that includes if, if uh, you need to hire a consultant to help you again with this, I'm, I'm okay tools. with that. Right. All you, tools. Yeah. Second. I, I, just, I just think this is so important, and I agree with you, Commissioner Hammond. I look back in 2014 when Commissioner Keiko was here when we were facing down flood when Bigot Waters was passed. And we went to Washington and seven of the eight items. And I'm not under some foggy eyes that we're going to go there and the world's going to change. But you don't get a hit unless you get up to bat. So I'd rather go to bat. Yeah, no, that's cool. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to make one, one more comment, and then I'm going to ask for some public comment, because we do have a couple cards that's uh, some folks that want to speak on this. but. Um, I, I really wasn't joking when I said that earlier was, you know, we, we, we rely on our federal government uh, to assist us and guide us, um, especially in disasters. And let's be honest, this blindsided Lee County. I didn't blindside just Lee County, city, well, city of Cape Coral received the same thing, city of Fort Myers, you know, so Many of this is, this is going on. It seems like it's, it seems unfair. I, I would ask our media to please do your homework. 
Do your homework. We're telling you we replied back. Or we're telling you those things. Do your homework. That's all I ask. Uh, I'd also, uh, Commissioner, when, when you're done. Sorry. Yes, uh, go ahead. I just, that was my question to staff is, okay, so we're talking about this now. We have your information. And um, we don't have another meeting for two weeks. So what are we going to do? We, can you have this, this um, discussion? How are we going to get not ahead of it? Obviously, because like Commissioner, our chairman said, we got blindsided for this. At least with the storm, we had no, notice was coming. We didn't know this was coming until Thursday. How are we going to be able to get this out, the com complete message to the community? Because this is going to be headlines for the media today. You're going to have one media source hiding under a business, a business, you know, a business letter, but they actually are working for the non-growth anti environment, the environmentalist anti-growth campaign. So, but the rest of the media, how do we get that message out of the factual information other than our website? We're going to provide the packet that we provided all of you and that we discussed today. Um, we are still doing fact finding, so we will continue to do that. Um, a lot of, a lot of the information that we have that will be requested by the media has to be redacted. There's a number of documents that have to be redacted, so there will be a process to do that. Um, I will turn it over to Chris Brady to talk a little bit about our entire communication plan, how we typically would communicate on any subject or any issue we have. So, Chris, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, Commissioner, thanks for the opportunity. Um, in, in, to Dave's point, to the county manager's point right now, uh, we are going through an extensive fact finding um, and document gathering. Uh, through uh, Mark and his team, through our IT team, as well as community engagement. So some of those um, previous educational opportunities, um, but even going back to, there was a number of board conversations very early on as it addressed some of the permitting and some of the 50% the rules. So we wanna gather all of that information, Commissioner, um, and yes, start with um, updating and building out in a specific landing site all of that information because we do have an Ian, um, an Ian dashboard, an Ian progress, and throughout the DCD website, there's a number of different areas that talk about um, disaster recovery permitting, um, the process, um, and the resources that are available. And then to your point, beyond that website, we want to make sure that we're creating content, digital media content, um, that would allow us to push information out through our newsletter, through our social media um, sites, um, and then also be able to share that information with our traditional media partners, um, even to the extent of we've had some very preliminary conversations um, about um, how we might be able to um, do either a, whether a press conference is the appropriate mechanism um, or uh, some other means of um, having face-to-face -face interaction with our media partners to be able to provide all of that information. But we want to make sure that <coughs> our community knows of all of the steps that have been taken and continue to be taken in order to, to not just maintain this rating, but also um, to address the board's will in pursuing an appeal process. So commissioners, um, we are also working uh, diligently with the municipalities. Um, to ensure that we have a, a united message. Um, we have a meeting with them this afternoon following our workshop to talk about this as well. We are also utilizing a number of our media components like the JIC, the joint information calls, to make sure that information gets out with all our partners as well. I believe there's 60 odd partners on there. So all that information is being shared uh, collectively between us and our, par our, our uh, municipal partners as well to make sure that information gets out to the community. And if I could, another question real quick, not just media, but um, since this is affecting four of the cities and the county too, so you have four government jurisdictions, obviously, that, that probably get you know, lost in the media, but are, those, are you working with those city managers also and the mayors and councils? I know they'll be looking to us for leadership and following, hopefully following our lead, joining our efforts to try to mediate this or arbitrate this so the federal government get an answer. Have you be working with them also? Yes, um, I've spoken to every city manager other than uh, the village of Estero, but our staff has been in contact with their staff as well. So um, we do have that call, that meeting this afternoon with um, a number of employees, including their uh, floodplain managers as well as ours. Uh, Richard and I will be on that meeting with each of the city managers and their attorneys as well. And what were their comments about receiving this information? Pretty much the same scenario. They got like the same scripted letters throughout the 18 month, 16 month process. Everyone that I spoke to received essentially the same message. 
um, and the same outcome. And they responded the same as we did and got the same response back. From they, they, typically, everybody had a similar response. Everybody, uh, Mark uh, outlined how we did substantial damage determination um, and how the municipalities were doing the same thing because we received the same help from the federal government, which was the Army Corps. And we also had some USAR teams involved as that, in, in that as well. Now, each one of us may have done something a little different, but that's what you would expect from a government. Each government has their own philosophy on how to do something, but it's not a major difference on how we operate. So we had all collectively, our floodplain managers talk on a regular basis, the city managers all talk on a regular basis during an event like this. We have our own personal call during an, during an event to talk about these things and afterwards. So every time we run into an event, we all work collectively um, to mitigate that issue. Commissioner Sandella. Um, since I've been here, we've put an awful lot of work into speaking and acting as one organization. I think that's helped us in many ways. And so whether it's our communities, whether it's the county, but I also trust that in this process, we're including our state legislators and so that we are speaking at, as one voice, you know, which I think will be more impactful and puts us all on the same page. Yes, Thank you. Um, yes, that, that is correct, Mr. Sandelli. Uh, Commissioner Sandelli. Um, Glenn has been working with our, our lobbyists for both the federal and state legislators. Thank you. All right, at this time, I'll open up for public comment. I have a few cards uh, that would like to speak on this item. So Joyce Campana. Good morning, my name is Joyce Campana. I live at 1410. Davis Drive in Fort Myers. Um, I've had a FEMA policy for over 15 years, so this caught my interest, not to mention it's already gone up. Uh, it probably will go up more. I found this presentation to be very interesting. I, I didn't get the packet. Maybe I looked too late on uh, the internet, but it would be nice if the packet that everybody got was made available to the public or on a separate site so we could see the whole thing together. Um, and the outline that the city manager gave of emails going back and forth I found to be helpful. I would question whether or not, um, email's great, but sometimes you just don't understand it. You know, I'd also like to see a list of how many phone conversations were made to <coughs> FEMA, with FEMA staff, and with whom. Now, maybe you need to get a different staff person at FEMA to review your information. I find that works real well in government. Um, so I'm just throwing that out there. I've heard a lot of talk about working with the communities that also received the same letter to have a joint front going to FEMA. What did the communities that got no change or were approved by FEMA, what did they do right that we didn't do? I would recommend going to those jurisdictions. I think Fort Myers Beach was one. What did they do that, that FEMA liked? And the first thing I'd ask is, did a different person review their information? Just because people view things differently. So those are two suggestions that I would make in terms of, of the public and um, information on this. And I understand about redacting personal and private information, but uh, I think at some point in time we need some names and records of personal conversations or conversations between staff members, not just emails. Also, uh, making this more accessible. I heard a lot of talk about going to the media, which is great, but having the information or the packets presented to the media also available uh, on the public site, because this is a hot issue, especially in this state where insurance costs for everything are going sky high. And I would also like to know the role of the governor. I know he works with FEMA when this hits the fan. And I'd also like to know what our federal elected officials, both state and U.S. House, are doing, other than campaigning. Why aren't they intervening as well? And I think it would certainly merit a trip, uh, as you said, to either D.C. or Atlanta. And I thank you for your efforts, and I uh, will be waiting to see what happens. I think you're off to a good start. Thank, thank you. Ma'am. 
Uh, up next, uh, Deborah Switzer Hitz. Hello again, this is Deborah Swisher Hicks from Greater Pine Island area. Um, I want to thank you guys for taking this on and looking at it. It does need to be addressed and it does affect me personally um, greatly because not only has our insurance has gone up, you know, and I didn't have a house that was severely damaged. It wasn't, unlike some others in this, in this uh, area. So it's, it's really concerning um, that this has happened and what loophole got stepped in and FEMA shoot us away and the attorney, I believe this is attorney, is correct that there should be another avenue. We don't take no for an answer. Do you know how many times I was denied for FEMA? I'm still denied in, in, in an appeal. And how many years is this now? This isn't good for our community. This isn't, you know, really not good for uh, low income communities. Um, and I hope this is seriously taken. It is reviewed by not only from our own in-house, we should have our own in-house specialist. How many times has something like this come across your guys' board in the last 20 something years? You know, this isn't new. Yes, different political items are, you know, possibly in play, but until we look to see where it failed and where it worked, we won't know. So hopefully it's a, going to be a broad look and we stay informed because this is, affecting a lot of people. Thank you. Uh, anyone else would like to speak? Uh, Marsha Ellis. Okay. Oh, you want to Wonderful, thank you. Um, Marsha Ellis, for the record. Uh, first of all, I want to co correct the uh, mistake uh, that County Har uh, Harner, kind of County Manager Harner made. Um, Estero uh, was previously rated a class six with a 20% reduction. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that point. Um, secondly, uh, you know, participation in CRS is voluntary. It's a program where the, the community relies on um, the direction of the Board of County Commissioners to uh, use their regulatory duty and powers to make decisions that reduce flooding risk for the community. Um, and uh, so some of uh, I appreciate Commissioner Ruane's comments that this is a great learning opportunity. There's a great deal of literature um, out there on this topic to help guide uh, communities, including, in fact, um, the very helpful, which I would urge everyone to review, it's a FEMA uh, Circular B573 from 2023. Um, when I, I feel like that, uh, that the, all of the development that's take place has really lost focus, it's broken focus of this, uh, uh, of the county, of the municipalities, it's pulled, <coughs> it, uh, pulled away from um, helping recovery and really focusing in on that recovery um, with the resources, with the leveraging of people, uh, and, uh, and, and, and that is in part responsible for what we're seeing. Um, that recovery should be precise and pinpoint and when that net is cast so wide, it has uh, in, in, in been a, an impediment to really truly serving those most in, in need, including those 590 properties referred to specifically by FEMA. Um, with CRS, they refer specifically to uh, uh, things that are supposed to happen under mapping and regulations. There's open space preservation to guarantee that currently open public or private floodplain parcels will be kept free of development. So so keeping that development out of the coastal high hazard area and not putting more development into that area to limit new buildings and fill in the floodplains as higher regulatory standards and to have regulations that are tailored to protect our critical facilities. I also want to say that uh, uh, new construction that minimizes erosion and protects and improves water quality as well as under floodplain management planning to protect natural functions within the community's plan, uh, floodplain and plan to conserve and or recover threatened and endangered species in the floodplain. There is clear guidance given in the CRS program to marry natural solutions that are protective of our hydrological functions in our corridors as well as our wildlife. And most importantly, to preserve open space and not continue to develop in these areas that will increase flooding risk in the future. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I, I, I know typically we don't um, respond to folks who make public comment, but I got to 
I got to go ahead and talk about a lot of the things that were just said there because I think um, it's really interesting to listen to that and think that a lot of that is real and true and accurate and and there's just a lot that I want to talk about there. One of the things that I think really was just hit home there is actually the fact that all of the things that help you earn your community rating system rating points are actually still intact here in Lee County. That, that FEMA is not disputing that we're no longer doing the things that we did and have done for the last 17 years to earn our community ratings points. Uh, they're, they're just disputing that we didn't turn in or answer some letters the way they wanted them to be answered. So, you know, it's, it's amazing because I can read the same thing that she just read, you know. These are how we earn points, right? Construction certificate management. We still do that. We've done that for 17 years in order to earn the points that we need for our CRS rating. Map information service, outreach projects. We've shown our outreach projects right there, uh, examples of them on the screen. Hazard disclosure, flood protection information, um, flood protection assistance, flood insurance promotion. We Again, we're promoting it right here through social media. Open space preservation. Like there is, we've done nothing but continue to add to our open space in Lee County through both the Conservation 2020 program and by making additional purchases and with, uh, with many of the new developments that have been uh, entitled here in Lee County, those new developments are now required to, to preserve up to, in some cases, 60% of the land. So open space requirement. What I'm saying is there are all of, these, all of these criteria that must be met in order for us to earn the points, the, uh, I think it was 2,900 uh, 40 points, 2,940 points, and that earned us a class five rating that allowed us to get our 25% discount that we have maintained since I believe 2007, if I'm reading the documentation right. We still do all of those things today. We didn't stop doing all of those things. All of those things are in place. FEMA's saying, oh yeah, but in the immediate aftermath of the storm though, when it came to figuring out if people were damaged more than 50%, you didn't do that the way we wanted to. That's not in here. That's not how you earn points. Okay? So, and, and maybe it is, I, you know, but that's just one criteria of the 2,940 points that we earned that earned us our five rating. And I dispute what FEMA says that we did it wrong. I think we've got the data to show them that we did it right. And I think that's what we need to focus on is showing them we did it right. I, and, and, and so there's just, here's the bottom line. Hurricane Ian knocked us down and FEMA kicked us while we were down. We already are seeing tremendous increases in our insurance here in Florida, and FEMA, which, like it or not, is led by the Joe Biden administration, is now adding another 25% onto those costs, okay? That is a reality that now people in Lee County, Florida, are going to have to face, thanks to this one person's decision. We need to appeal this. We need to do everything we can to fight this, to protect our residents and help them recover. And then finally, lastly, Reality speaks for itself. Look outside. Look at Lee County right now. We're a year and a half from the third costliest storm in the history of the United States. We're a year and a half from the most expensive storm to ever hit the state of Florida. If you drive around our community today, people are back at work, kids are back at school, the economy is thriving and growing. We're doing a good job. Our county staff is doing a good job. We'll figure out what the deal is with this paperwork thing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Hammond. Any more public comment? Because I wanted to add some comments. I, I, there is a, a little more public comment. Uh, okay. You want to do? No, nope, wait. wait. Okay. No. Um, please, Mr. County Fraser. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioners. And uh, to follow from uh, Commissioner Hammond's comments just there, I mean, there really are only two options. It's either their ignorance or their malice that's resulted in this uh, action on their part. Uh, I can tell you from our experience last year, uh, they were woefully ignorant of their own rules and we can be sympathetic in some ways because trying to draw up rules for 3,000 different counties is a challenge uh, but that wiggle room that exists in those rules is for them to work with communities not to punish them uh, and I'm concerned actually to some extent that our victory last year uh, is now being more doubly punished uh, with the action that's taken here so I would encourage you to follow the path as has already been recommended by your attorney uh, and your manager but I would also encourage uh, you as a political body uh, to also look at this through the political lens. Uh, the truth is that Florida is a donor state to the FEMA federal uh, program. They need our money to balance the losses they pay primarily in the Mississippi Valley. Florida has looked at previously leaving the program entirely because it is a net loser for our citizens to pay into the program. 
you are a very large jurisdiction in a very important state. So your position that you share with your political peers in both the legislative and congressional delegation about what decisions should or should not be made about Florida's presence in the program entirely uh, should not be taken lightly. Uh, you have a lot more control of the situation than I suspect the one or two bureaucrats in the behemoth of FEMA understands that you do. So again, our office stands ready to help you if you need some assistance. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other comment at this time? Please. Please state your name when you come up, please. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners, Mr. Chairman. My name is Marcus Contos. I'm at 20291 Carter Road in Estero. I'm a 33-year Lee County resident, obviously here for both storms. Uh, I want to piggyback off of what Commissioner Hammond was talking about. We were de declared a national disaster area twice, okay, twice. There's got to be a firm out there that can find the grant money, send out a questionnaire to every Lee County resident. Were you promised? Because I was visited by three, four different government, state and federal government agencies and made promises and signed off on things. I never heard anything. I'm still fixing stuff. And still, a couple weeks ago, I, I finished a barn roof, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I don't hear anything, there's no follow-up, and I'd love for the county residents, each of them, to get that questionnaire. Where were you, and did you get it? Did you actually get what you were promised? And then go after it, because twice national disaster areas, there's gotta be some grant money out there where we have the rights to follow up on that and see where people, given what they were promised, is really the key. And I think that the answer is gonna be no way too many times. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, I'll close public comment. We'll come back to the board. Uh, Commissioner Pendergrass. I just want to comment on Commissioner Hammond's comments. So thank you for bringing that up. And that's the reality of it. This is what's happened here. And I also do think we need to take what uh, Park Fraser Cole said. We need to use um, Senator Scott, Senator Rubio, and a congressional delegation and Byron Donalds to help us get our message across. I think with that team effort with the cities, we should hopefully get some answers and get them to relook at this. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time? I mean, board comment, excuse me. Um, okay, I'd, I'd like to clarify the motion. Uh, Mr. County Attorney, would, uh, could we please, uh, Mr. Hammond, work with Mr. Hammond, let's make sure we clarify this motion before we do it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the motion uh, working in concert with, uh, with Commissioner Ruane was to basically provide any and all tools necessary to our county administration to respond to this uh, to, to this allegation and, and hopefully uh, with the goal of getting to an appeal and getting this overturned. Okay. Does that, does that? That's that's and, and, and I think your comment of you know, learning from this experience of you know, finding a firm, I still think is your main. Yeah, it, absolutely, including up to hiring a consultant if, if that's what it takes. I mean, it's after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Second. I'm second that actually. We have a motion from uh, Commissioner Hammond. Second. A second from Commissioner Wayne. County Attorney uh, Mr. County Attorney. Mr. Chairman, just to clarify for staff's understanding, basically what you're directing us to do is do whatever we need to do to achieve a positive result, if at all possible. Everything and anything. And report back. Absolutely. We understand. Clarify. Thank you, sir. Just the last comment. Yes, sir. Any further comment, please? So, you know, why are we struggling as a community? You look at Fort Myers Beach, you look at Pine Island, you look at Fort Myers, uh, Sanibel. Our family owns a home in Sanibel and it's a second home. We're on our eighth adjuster. We've gotten zero dollars and zero cents. Promised by one after another after another getting a check. I'm not aware of a condominium complex that's started resurrection in Sanibel. They're all going to litigation. Why is Sanibel down 32%? Why is Fort Myers Beach down 40%? They're still trying to build back things. There's still insurance issues that are unresolved. And my claim clearly is a flood claim. It has nothing to do with wind. I've agreed it's flood. The house needs to be torn down. It's a simple process. Pay the premium. That's not what they're doing. And just to add on to Commissioner um, uh, property appraiser Caldwell's comment, 
back in 14 when we went to Washington, we were at $12 billion surplus, the state of Florida, back in 14, on what we contributed to the National Flood Program. And that was in 14. I understand Ian was devastating, but we had 10 more years of paying premium before Ian happened. Okay? Just think about what that amount is now. Instead of 12 billion, it's probably 20, 30 billion. Even if they had to take money out, it was still a donor and continue to be. And I'm just appalled at the federal's actions through this whole program. And it's really just unfortunate because the citizens that are hurting right now, they don't need another punch in the gut. We went through enough. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Hammond, a second from Commissioner Rain. Are there any objections to the motion? Seeing no objections, a uh, motion is approved unanimously. Um, so <laughs> take a deep breath. <laughs> um, all right, is there, I see no further business in front of us. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. County Attorney. You Thank you, Mr. Away. Chairman. While we have nothing further for the board's consideration, I just want to point out for the public record that that photograph is not taken from a view of any boat that I own. <laughs> ah, there you go. It's listed as county attorney items with that photograph, but we're not associated with that vessel in any way. I'd like to be, but. All right. I wonder why they chose that. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, moving to public present, uh, presentation of matters by citizens. Uh, is there any uh, one else? Nope. Okay. Um, okay. Seeing. Yeah, I was going to announce. Uh, Mr. Harner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to update you that uh, this afternoon at 1 30 at the County Administration Building, uh, Admin East. We'll be holding the fiscal year 25, 24, 25 draft budget assumptions and spending target workshop. Okay, now I see no further business in front of us. Um, thank you for everyone coming today and giving your public comment and listening. Thank you. Um, we are adjourned. <laughs>